Well, today we're looking at the lesson of 1 John 19. Let, let's have a word of prayer and then I'll read it. You know, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. I just gave you testimony to it in my own life. You can't live it nor learn it. In carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude types, sins of the tongue or overt sins. They must be confessed for the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth. He is the spirit of truth that lives inside your body through what's called the indwelling. He's there to teach, recall, disclose, reveal. Oh, my goodness. The word of God and how marvelous he is in it both in the good times and when your life is full of light and sometimes when there is darkness. He's always the light that brings great revelation to your soul and encouragement. Don't live a day without it. and Don't try to study the Bible without this indwelling. When you confess your sin, according to 1 John 1, 9, you will be cleansed by the blood of Christ as a believer for restoration to spirituality. It's not a salvation passage. It's a restoration passage bringing you back into the indwelling ministry that is all about the church age of the Holy Spirit. Father, we're so thankful <clears throat> for your daily guidance, your constant encouragement, we become to know the power of the word comforter. One of the titles given to the Holy Spirit to my life and this church. And what a great comforter he is, Father, in your absence, he's present. What a powerful, what a powerful thing that is in our life. I pray today, Father, we would look to that power of the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth that he might teach it so that we might be freed from the cosmic system of lies. We might find the power of the word of God that resides within us that becomes the critic of the intentions and the thoughts of our hearts. But well, we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are in 1 Kings 19. Verse 1 talks about Ahab's report to Jezebel of what occurred on Mount Carmel, his view. His view. So he told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. And Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, watch this now. So may the gods do to me. Well, that'll come back. That'll come back to roost. May the gods do to me and even more. If I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Elijah was afraid. He arose and he ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba. I'm going to stop there. We'll pick that up next time. What has happened to this great man of God? What has happened to him? Here is a spiritual mature believer that's been part of two of the most phenomenal mi miracles on Mount Carmel. Miracles from the hand of God and nobody could question it. It won the miracle of lighting the fire and winning win or take all in the contest. And then the rain, the rain that came off of the Mediterranean Sea with its uh, powerful existence of heavy rain, removing the drought, restoring Israel uh, economically and all the things that would come with that rain in an agricultural economy. And here we find this man running by an empty threat. 
an empty threat, running for his what? <laughs> Where is he going to run for his life? Where do you see, think it came from? Where do you think your life has come from? Huh? Where do you think your life has come from, big guy? Nisha Haim. Where do you think that come from? Where do you think your life came from? How are you going to run for your life? Where are you going to run to? The only person that has the power of life is God Almighty. Nisha Haim. The breath of God. Every day you breathe, you breathe the breath of God. You don't necessarily breathe the life of God, but you breathe the breath of God. If you want the life of God, you have to accept Christ as your Savior. Believe that he died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. The power of the gospel is the power of salvation, and that is what brings you into the life of God. Eternal life. No man can come to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The life. You suppose Elijah knows that? Of course. Do you know that? Of course. Where is he going to run for his life? Well, let me tell you, the one place you don't want to run from is run from God. Because there's where your life is. If you think there's a life apart from God, there's only death. There's no life. This is not going to be a good scene when he runs for his life. Well, last week we studied uh, Jezebel's threat made against Elijah. I want you to look at three parts, and I put them in bold print. This is, this is why it's an empty threat. Number one. May the gods do to me and even more. There's no such thing. <clears throat> There's no such things. The gods, gods with a little g, are all man-made. It's the idolatry system. They're all made by man. There is only one God. There's only one God. When you don't want that God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, if you don't want that package of one, Trinity, Godhead, then you have to go to the world. When you go to the world, you've got the capital, you've got the G Satan God, 1 John 5, 19, and he runs a whole system under it of idolatry. In his system, if you don't like a certain kind of God, you make your own up, and we'll, that's okay with us. Just whatever God you want, you can have. Come up with your own. Well, I like frogs. Okay, then you can, your God can be the frogs. Well, I like the alligators. Okay, you can have an alligator. <laughs> as long as I am the chief God. That's... That's Satan's system. It stands in opposition. He does it in Matthew, the fourth chapter, 1 through 11. When he tempts Jesus, before Jesus begins his earthly ministry, he tempts Jesus. And it's all about who you're going to worship. You're going to worship me, the little G God, or you're going to worship the big G God. But if you worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms that have been given to me. I will give them to you. Of course, that was, a, that was an empty threat, too, about an empty promise because he couldn't give it because he didn't have them anyhow. And the whole thing was to get Jesus from going to the cross because going to the cross defeated him. You see, it's, it's not brain surgery. He, he's dumb as a brick, but he does understand the brick. 
I mean, if he had a half a sense about him, he would, he would have been saved and not had the fall and all that business. He, we give him way too much credit. He's stupid. And he can't do anything about me saying it. Because of 1 John 4, 4, greater is he who is in me than he is in the world. I'm not threatened by him at all. He's a roaring lion without teeth. But he is a liar. He is the king of lying. Jesus said it in John 8. He describes him in John 8. You ought to pay attention to that description and stop cowering towards him. Jeez. He's got no power over your life but what God allows. We'll see it today. Well, anyhow, number one, so may the gods do to me. Oh, my goodness. May the gods do to me. And even more, number two, if I don't make your life she got power over a believer's life. Jezebel's got power over a believer's life. Zero. Nobody has authority over your life. Well, you say the police, uh, the, the government, they don't have authority over your life. They have authority structurally. They don't have authority over your life. Only one person has authority over your life. And that's God. Are you a believer? Your heavenly father has authority. He's the only one that has authority over you. You're under a lot of authority systems. And listen, when they're wrong, God intervenes. I don't know. May the gods do to me and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them dead prophets. And then, listen, here's the third empty threat. By tomorrow. By tomorrow? By tomorrow you have that? I mean, by tomorrow? <laughs> She's got power over tomorrow? Listen, her gods have done nothing so far, right? They got whipped unmercifully at Mount Carmel. Her prophets couldn't get one iota of information from Baal or Asherah. <laughs> and she's made the gods do to be. Listen, they, ain't, they didn't, they said they're, they're on vacation somewhere. <laughs> they had a lot of because they didn't show up the other day. I don't think I'm worried about them showing up today either. May the gods do to me and even more if I don't make your life the life like one of these prophets. I mean, I, this is just empty threats. Listen, all she's doing is threat, all she's doing is yakking. We know about that, don't we, guys? All she's doing is yakking. Just run her in her mouth. Just run her in her mouth. And then by tomorrow, 24 hours. You got 24 hours. You better enjoy it because after 24 hours, you're going to be. Uh... And what's he do? And then he goes like, Bring it on. I did it in Mount Carmel. I can do it. Is that real? Because my God is almighty. My God is greater than everything. You want to do it? Bring it on. Where's the fight? Stand and fight. The fight of faith. 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Gone, in it? No faith here. L listen to what it says. He was afraid. 
He arose and he ran. He ran for his life. He didn't run for his life theologically or he ran to God. You would be smart when your life gets in a mess to run to God because there's no fix apart from it. You run for your life in all the wrong directions. This was an empty threat because she can't fulfill any of these. She can't fulfill the first one because there are no gods. She can't fulfill the second one because she don't have that kind of power. No weapon can be formed against me. That's what Elijah should have thought. No weapon can be formed against me. She's got, listen, the only power she has is to convince him to fall on his own sword. Come on. The only power she has is to cause him to think that he needs to fall on his own sword. She's got no power over his life. First of all, she's a foreign queen. The second of all, she's got gods that aren't in existence. So all they got is an figment of her imagination. Tomorrow, <laughs> she's, she's got the power of tomorrow. Boy, is she arrogant. And he listens to that foolishness. The question is, why would he listen? This was an empty threat since she doesn't have the legal nor the spiritual authority to do what she said. She has issued an empty threat which has caused Elijah to run for his life when no one is chasing. It's a threat. <laughs> the threat. Let's talk about five things this morning. Only God can authorize such an attack against a believer. Make sure you know that. And when you read Job 1 and 2, and you have, you will understand that even if the devil, if, listen, if the devil wants to mess with your wealth, he has to get permission. If he wants to mess with your health, he has to get permission. And when he gets permission, it's undeserved suffering. It's for the cause of Christ. Can't tell you how many times I've told that to my wife. Why am I going through this suffering? I tell you the same thing every time. To bring glory to God in the angelic world. To bring glory to God. Because every time that you suffer an undeserved suffering, it is because of the angelic conflict. The war between God and Satan, a real war, by the way, an invisible war that only the believer with spiritual eyes can see and understand. And boy, I have. And the person going through it and you're coaching, you have got to tell them that's an invisible war and you've been selected to be the David to fight. This is an invisible war, and you've been the David selected to fight. And you must fight it with spiritual weapons, Ephesians 6. And the key to fighting that with the spiritual weapons of Ephesians 6 is found in verse 10. Be strong in the Lord in the might of his strength. And when you fight that fight of faith with the spiritual weapons, God is glorified by the victory of faith. Faith, 1 John 5, 4, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And listen, when you overcome the world, you've overcome the God of the world in 1 John 5, 19. Say John, 1 John 5, 4 and 19. In Job, the second chapter, verse 6, when it came to his health. So the Lord said to Satan, behold, he, Job, is in your power, only spare his life. 
You see? What is Elijah running for? And who's got the power over it? God, not man. You never fear, Matthew 10, 28, you never fear man who says he has power over your life and death because he doesn't. Only God has that for a believer. Man, did you write that down? You better write it down. One day it's going to knock on your door. When this happened to Job, in the end, it resulted in positive spiritual experience in his life. You must read Job 42, 10 through 17. Because if you come out of this undeserved suffering, you will have been so better off for it. Because it's all about grace. You don't get through this life without grace. Grace, grace, marvelous grace. Marvelous grace. And it's a story that says God's grace is sufficient, isn't it, Job? Job in 42 says God's grace is sufficient. That's the wonderful part of it. The Lord restored and gave an increase of twofold. The Lord blessed the latter days more than before. And after this experience, when the book of Job closed, God extended his life 142 years. See who's got control of life? Leave your life in the hands of God. You'll be so much more benefited by it in time and eternity. Extended his life 142. And it says he lived four generations more with his family. And he died an old man. Full of the days. Full of days. That's how you live them, isn't it? You might count them in years, but you live them in days. You see, you want to go through it with a positive experience, and that depends on your volition. Whether you want to cut and run or stand and fight. I tell you, stand and fight. When this happened to Paul in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, especially verse 7, he had a positive experience. A positive spiritual experience. He wrote, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation that he had went to heaven, for this reason to keep me from exalting myself, and that an interesting way to say that, he got a good look into heaven life. He called it surpassing greatness of revelation. I read this to my wife the other night. But to keep me from exalting myself about what I witnessed and viewed, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. The word in the Greek language means to strike with a fist. It's, it's a bare fist fight to the end. A bare knuckle fist fight to the end. The Greek word. And why? To keep me from exalting myself. Hmm. See, he went through a lot of difficult things undeserved. Because God had a motive that he didn't understand until he went through it. Not to exalt himself. God touched part of his old man, Cosmos Diabolicus. Cosmo, old man, you know, old man, Cosmos Diabolicus, thinking. He touched the sore spot on him. Sense of arrogance. Still had a little bit of arrogance that needed to be 
cleaned out. Get rid of. To be complete in Christ. I know. A spiritual mature guy. I know. I know. What was God teaching Paul? He tells you what he was teaching you. He says in verse 9 of chapter 12, my grace is sufficient. Watch what he says. Footnote, power perfected in weakness. Power perfected in weakness. Where weakness is a good thing. Because his weakness became God's strength. Power perfected in weakness. There's a lesson for all of us, and he's going to teach it to us the easy way or the hard way. But when it happened to Elijah, it had a negative spiritual experience. Why would Elijah, a spiritually mature believer, run when no one was chasing? The woman, the widow at Zarephath, who was a witch of Baal, declared when he left her to go to Mount Carmel that he was a man of the truth of the word of God. He converted her and left her a missionary to her people and went to Mount Carmel. This is a man of God, a man with the truth of the word of God in his mouth, she said. A man who has the word of God as truth in his mouth. And Elijah goes to Mount Carmel. And submits to the power of God through faith. For two miracles to happen. And now he's running. For his life. My, 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 don't let it happen to you. Do not let it happen to you. It does not have to happen to you. Do not let it happen to you. Point two, Elijah certainly knew biblically that Jezebel's threat was an empty, powerless threat. Biblically, he knew that, like you do. It could not affect his life or the plan of God without divine permission, Job 1 and 2. Plus, it was hearsay. She didn't attend the Mount Carmel experience. She got it from her husband second hand. This threat, she wasn't an eyewitness to this. She wasn't permitted on Mount Carmel. She wasn't, uh, she wasn't an Israelite and wasn't a tribal leader. My, my, my. <laughs> her threat could only happen, watch this now, by Elijah's negative volition towards the directive will of God, which was the spiritual reformation. What God wanted to do from Mark Carmel was to bring the spiritual awakening that had come from the drought into a spiritual reformation of getting rid of adultery and putting God on the rightful place of worship in Israel, the priest nation, the divine agency, the custodian of the word of God and evangelism to the world. The victory of Mount Carmel showed that the fight was between God and Satan and not between Jezebel and Elijah. 1 Corinthians 1.22, what happened at Mount Carmel was a sign to Israel that God should be back on his throne. Not only in Israel, but in the hearts of the people. She became a distraction from the directive will of God to Elijah and the Israelites. And he should have done 
with her threat what Jesus did with Peter. When Peter got in his face, he told Peter to get behind me whom? Satan. In other words, Satan was trying to have another moment of interference, like in Matthew 4. But he's a coward. He always fights behind the scene, un unknown and un un unaware, unless you have spiritual eyes to know this. And by the time you wake up, he's got you into 1 Timothy 2.26. He's got you in a trap to do his will. To do his bidding. My, my. Wake up, church. She was a distraction. She was a stumbling block. And listen, a stumbling block is to get you distracted from the will of God. Jesus talks to him about that. A stumbling block because you're not setting your mind on God's interest. You're setting it on man. See that? That's old man. <clears throat> That's old man, cosmos, diabolicus thinking versus new man, divine viewpoint thinking. This is happening to a spiritual mature believer. This is Elijah. This is a person that people recognize is a man of the word of God and speaks from his mouth comes truth of God. Three, remember the key issue in the angelic conflict is volition or free will. There are two poles to volition. There's a positive pole, which would tell you walk by faith, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's a negative pole that would tell you to walk by sight and walk by flesh. It's a volitional choice. The positive pole, walk by faith, the faith cycle, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, 16 and 17. And the opposite pole, don't walk by sight and don't walk in the flesh. The, this is volitional. Nobody should have to tell you a hundred times a day to do that. You have the indwelling Holy Spirit that teaches it to you and reminds you of it, brings conviction on your soul about it. Do it. The longer you drag your feet, the worse off you're going to be. Elijah. Here's Romans 12, 2 that describe it. Negative volition is conformity to the world. Do not be conformed to the world. That's old man cosmos diabolical thinking. Don't be conformed to the way the world thinks. We call it cosmos diabolicus. And when it shows up in your life, it didn't just show up out of the wild blue. It's based on some kind of premise that you're, that's being motivated by a false view. A false view, a lie. A lie that you've bought into and are still setting on it. It could be a lie that come out of your childhood and you're still stuck on it. Volitional. The positive, the positive volition is about transformation, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ephesians, in, when get, Paul jumps into Ephesians and Colossians, in Ephesians 4, 20 through 24, which is one sentence in the Greek language, it should be read together. He tells you to put off the old man and to put on the new man by the renewing of your mind. I mean, he's consistent with his theology. We're inconsistent with it. Elijah has gone back to old man cosmos diabolicus thinking. Right? Well, he's running by fear. What was the key word? Elijah was afraid. He arose and ran. He was afraid. 
That's cosmic fear. That's not the fear that comes from God. That's the fear that comes from the world. I don't know why I'm hollering. I have no idea. It's just that I've been, I guess I've been speaking so softly that I need to holler a little bit. I just don't know why I'm hollering. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think the internet can't get, oh, I don't think I can get to the internet unless I holler. It's somewhere in a cloud somewhere, so I have to holler. <clears throat> Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, new man, divine viewpoint thinking, that you, watch this, and here's the divine purpose. The word that is divine purpose. And here's the divine purpose that you may prove. That you may prove. So you don't have to go through this again. This is the word prove that gets you approved. This is the word in the Greek language, prove, that means you're approved. Don't come back and do this again with me because you got approval. That you may prove, the divine purpose, that you may prove so you get it settled in your soul and let's get done with this. We don't want to keep coming back to this. I'm going to live by transformation of the renewal of my mind. I'm going to keep coming back to this. That you may prove what the will of God is that is good, acceptable, and perfect. Okay? That's, that's transformational thinking. That's new man, divine viewpoint thinking. You know what he's running from? He's running from the will of God, Annie. What, what's the directive will of God? I want a spiritual reformation. And she's got him running away from it. It's Jonah all over again. It's Peter all over again. Well, anyhow. <clears throat> so, here's a beware. Beware. Beware when you think that old man Cosmos Diabolicus could not exist in the life of a spiritual mature believer. I hear more Christians... <clears throat> Tell me that. And it don't matter how many times I show in the Bible that that idea is not true. <clears throat> they don't want to believe it. You know why? Because they're caught up in the snare of the trap. Listen, you should always be ready to believe what the word of God confirms. And here's Elijah. Elijah's a spiritual mature person. When Peter had it, Peter was a spiritual mature person. Listen, God don't push you over, over, overload you when you don't have the capacity for it. He don't put more on your plate than you can eat. Come on now. For, all right, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He never puts more on your plate than you can eat and never forget that. So go ahead and eat your peas. Beware that when you think that old man cosmos that could not exist in the life of a spiritual mature believer, you pay attention. You pay attention to somebody like Elijah because he was certainly spiritually mature. And Peter and Jonah, listen, they wouldn't have got the assignments they had got if they hadn't been spiritually mature. You don't give them to babies or immature. You give them to mature people. All right. I guess we got that off the plate, okay? All right. Point number four. They all had one thing in common. Elijah, Peter, Jonah. A volitional struggle with obedience to the direct will of God. There's the bottom line, people. They all did. Every one of these guys, you can go in there and you can look where their departure came. And they have all have one thing in common. Jesus told Peter, for example, that he would deny Jesus three times. He told him that at the Last Supper. John 13, 36 through 38. Jesus told Peter in Luke, the 22nd chapter, 31, 32, at that supper, Peter uh, Jesus told him that Satan had gotten permission from God to sift him like wheat. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. 
Listen, God don't give permission to Satan to sift a believer unless he's spiritually mature. Read Job. Look how he described Job. Or go back and read that in chapter 1 and chapter 2 because every time Satan came before him and picked on a believer, God looked at the believer and said, this is the character of that believer. You got him. Because he'll give you such a beating in the end, you wish you never brought his name to your lips. I add lived a little bit with that. I'm not quite sure how far that went. I'm just saying, that's what I'm thinking. Peter said to him, in that moment, Jesus said that to Peter. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Right? We know how that went. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you don't, you can read about it, Matthew 26, 69 through 75, in detail. You know, that's the business with the rooster crowing. You know, if God can't get you conviction any other way, he'll send a rooster in your life. A bird. I'm sorry, chicken. Yeah, <laughs> I'll probably have fried chicken for lunch today. I have no idea, but I bet it'll be fried chicken. What do you think? I bet I'll have fried chicken. Point number five in closing. What caused Elijah to run when no one was chasing? If you read carefully 1 John 9, 3, you will find the answer. He was afraid. Yahweh, that's philos. In the English, we call them phobias. And he arose, kum, and he ran, yalak. All three of these, now pay attention, are cal imperfects. Means that's a series. He was afraid. He arose. He ran. All in one series. Boom, boom, boom. Wasn't like one day I was this, and the next week I was this, and a month I was that. No, no. Boom, boom, boom. He react his his a rising and running was a reaction to his fear. His fear was a reaction to old man thinking because it's cosmic fear, not spiritual fear. It's not based on the word of God and spiritual. It's a negative. Yeah. Cosmos fear was the motivational factor in him running when no one was chasing We have a saying of this type of cosmic fear. When I was a kid, they would say, he's afraid of his own shadow. You ever heard that? I don't know where that comes from, but I know how it was used. And what it meant was, he's afraid of fear. A fear of fear. That's the cosmic system. And, and listen, that type of fear... Worldly fear always leads to flight. Always leads to flight. Whoever has cosmic fear is always running from it. Because of the fear of fear, afraid of their own shadow. And listen, what has to be removed is his fear. Now, fear is a mental attitude sin in this regard. But the confession of the sin does not remove, remove what is motivating the fear. How do we know what it was? Listen to me now. How do I know what the fear was attached to? Because fear is always attached to a, a phobic. A phobic fear is always attached to something in your life. So we know that what his fear was, was attached to his life because he was running for his what? Running for his life. And listen, all phobic, all phobias are that way. They're all, that's how the phobic, that's how psychologists makes a living. Or one way. Listen to what the Bible says, Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man, that's what we're talking about. The fear of man brings a snare. It's a trap. 
But he who trusts in the Lord, see the faith system? What conquers the fear system of the world is the faith system of God. Renewing your mind to the will of God. And it's always categorical thinking. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Proverbs 29, 25. David and Goliath would be an example of positive listening to the rectal will of God in 1 Samuel 17. Here is David. Here is the whole, whole army of Israel. What are, what's the Bible say about him? They were afraid. Goliath come out, come out and says, I'll take one, two, or three, or whatever you want. Bring me, bring me your best, winner take all. And when David showed up, he was put out, wasn't he? Send me a kid, no medals on him. What, what have you ever done there, you crazy kid? What, what have you ever done? We'll kill the bird. I'll kill the lion. I get you today because I got the bear by God, I got the lion by God, and I'll get you by God. But, but maybe he didn't say by God. But maybe he did. You're going to get him anyhow, any. You know why? Because he understands 1 John 5 4. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. It's not brain surgery. This is simple, people. This is not complex. This is not deep, heavy theology. This is practical life. After being paralyzed by fear, self-induced misery, what did he run for? Not from? See, he's not running from. He's running for. See, what's got to be correct in his life is not what he's running from, it's what he's running for. Ah, all right. You may have sleep on it to get it. Let me give you these passages. Write these down. They're not on your paper. 1 Peter 2.11. Hebrews 4.12. 6.18 through 20. 1039, James 1, 21. Yeah, I love this. It says faith preserves the soul. Think about that. Faith, the exercise of faith, the faith cycle preserves your soul. Preserves your soul. The word of God functioning in your life preserves your soul being renewed every day. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word today as we've looked at fear running when no one's chasing. R but running for what? Running to what? Running for what? Oh, Father. Father. Help us understand. Help us understand that life is not that complex. We make it that way, and when it gets that way, we're all mixed up. The life of faith is a simple life. It's a life of obedience and trust. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. Encourage our hearts today through Elijah. Encourage our hearts through Elijah. In Jesus' name, amen.